Okay. Yeah. Let's go. Scammon County Board of County Commission Special Meeting, January 12, 2023, 9 o'clock a.m. Please turn your cell phone to vibrate silence or the offsetting. Board of County Commission allows any person to speak re regarding the item on the agenda. The speaker is limited to three minutes unless otherwise determined by the chairman to allow for sufficient time for all speakers. Speakers shall refrain from abusive or profane remarks, disruptive outbursts, protests, or other conduct which interferes with the orderly conduct of the meeting. We'll start with the pledge. Commissioner Bogosha, you lead us in the pledge. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Bagash. Was the meeting properly advertised? Mr. Chairman, this meeting was advertised on January 5th, 2023 in the Escambia Sun Press and the board's weekly meeting schedule. Thank you. Uh, are, are there any items to be added to the agenda? No, sir. None for me? None for me. No, sir. No, sir. No. Thank you. Uh, we do not have it on the agenda, but uh, if you guys need a commissioner's form, not shaking head no. No, you're good. Um, All right, great. Mr. Chairman, can, can we have a motion to adopt the agenda? I'm so sorry. Thank you, sir. Thank so you moved. so much. We have a motion. Second. Second, please vote. I apologize. Uh, and it doesn't look like everyone's logged in yet. Can we so just wait? Can you just raise our hand, guys? Yeah. Thanks. That's right. That passes yeah. five in favor. Thanks. Uh, yes. Mr. Chairman, I would like to recognize uh, the firefighter that passed away uh, this week, um, and uh, Lieutenant Jackson. Um, and so, of course, our thoughts and prayers with him and his family as they go through this time. Appreciate all of his service, not only to the county, but also our country. Uh, and uh, thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I actually had him on my uh, comment list as well as uh, Chief Warner Seaman. As many of you know, we honored him about 32 days ago. He was the last living Pearl Harbor survivor in our county, maybe in our state. He died the same day as Lieutenant Jackson. Um, they're very much alike. They both started their careers as enlisted sailors out of high school. One stayed in the Navy and did 30 years. The other one got out and served us in our county. And they both have remarkable stories, although they didn't have the same years and days. They had the same story in a relative way, and I'm glad that um, they were among us and served for us. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. And certainly our condolences and prayers go out to that, to that family. Uh, I did need do some correction uh, on last meeting when we talked about the um, bringing back of the Martin Luther King Jr. Um, commemorative uh, event uh, because of COVID. Uh, all the events have been postponed for the last two years. But we're excited uh, that the commemoration will be Sunday at 2 o'clock at the Zion Hope Primity Baptist Church uh, on Leonard Street. Um, Living the Dream will be uh, at Brownsville at 5.30 uh, this, uh, on Saturday, um, January the 14th. And uh, on Monday, uh, the parade at 11 o'clock uh, right downtown here on Palafox Street uh, will be. So we're very thankful to the entire um, MLK commemorative um, committee uh, for bringing all these events uh, back to Pensacola and to Escambia County. Mr. Chairman, before we continue, I guess we're going to do a little commissioner. Yeah, we I did. guess we are. Yeah, so sorry. I would be remiss if I did not thank Vicki Campbell, ECUA uh, District 1 Rep, and Bruce Woody, Executive Director of the ECUA, for joining me on my coffee with the commissioner yesterday. Very interesting topics, a great conversation, so uh, appreciation to those folks for getting up early. And of course, as always, appreciation to Wes Marino and Eric Gilmore for joining me and giving county updates. Also want to point out tomorrow um, in the Bellevue community of District 1, we'll be doing a neighborhood cleanup. You can go to myscambia.com and you can see all the details. But if you have tires or uh, other appliances, things of this nature, uh, there's a list of what you can put out and will be picked up. So we did one a couple weeks back in Beulah, very successful in District 1. We're going to do another one. So for anyone who's watching that lives in that area of Bellevue, um, by all means, participate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner McGosh. Certainly appreciate it. Did we have any speakers for public forum at all? Uh, we have speakers, but not for public forum. None for public forum. Mr. May, excuse me, There's no public Mr. May, I tried to sign off, but she said you guys didn't have it on the schedule. We don't have, so there's no public forum? No, no public forum. She just okay. said she didn't have the ability to do it, but we could ask. Okay. So technically, are we good with not having public forum, Allison? It, 
it doesn't ever hurt to have a public forum. You can certainly limit it in time. Mm -hmm. okay. So what, what's okay? Chairman, why don't we ask how many people would like to speak? Kevin Wade, 413 Southeast Boblets. Oh. I, I, I love this place. I feel that we are living in a golden hour of it, this, this part of the world. This is what we're looking at five to 600 years of history of people living in a, what is this now Escambia County. Um, but the golden hour to Matt Sullivan and EMS is something completely different than our dreams. Um, these are the people that protect us. Um, you get struck and have massive internal injuries on the Muskogee Bridge. That golden hour rule means you have one hour to be able to get onto a table to be cared for, or <laughs> you don't get any more hours. Um, the dreams that I see playing out of the Three Mile Bridge of broadband in this county, this area, are, are so many of you are just doing so much to knock it out of the park. Allison, thank you. Our, Commissioner, it's watching legal go ahead and knock it out of the park with a letter. Oh, these people who are there in our time of need, these angels, um, they're people too. And what they do to protect us, they need protection. And the, I would say, witch hunt that happened to our EMS. Um, and the debacle, and, and I actually thanked our former administrator for keeping you all in the loop, but that was tongue in cheek. I was beaten for that because no one caught that it was tongue in cheek. Um, I, seeing the drama placed upon these EMS people and the fact that the, the powers that be said, we're going to go ahead and keep beating on you until you eventually sign something saying that you may have done something wrong. Or we're just going to have an administrative judgment against you not saying something wrong. We can't prove anything, but we're going to go after you legally until you have no no breath. And uh, Kevin, uh, could you wrap it up? You all have about you. 10 seconds. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman May. Uh, Lispina 413 Southeast Boblets. I, I understand what Kevin's saying about a golden hour. There's a lot of fantastic things happening, and we'll be thanking you guys for the broadband issue next. Um, but what I see also happening is local officials struggling against a statewide tide of losing our rule of law. It's nice, isn't it? Isn't it fun? Because technically what the clerk is doing is illegal. I mean, she knows that she's not going to get prosecuted for it, so she's just going to be large and in charge. And Commissioner Bender, I apologize because I was so frustrated yesterday because I thought this was another example of this over at the TPO. After we got up at 4 a.m. to prepare for that and drive over, I realized this morning that the way that I filled that form out was confusing to you. I was trying to save paper. I should have filled out four. So my apologies on that. Um, it's times like this, like I said on Commissioner Bergash's blog, I wish that my mind worked so that I believed that there's a checks and balance bad and good column that determines whether you go upstairs or downstairs when you die. 
I have never been able to think like that. Even when I was a little kid in Catholic school, my mind just can't operate like that. But at times like this, I wish that it did. And it constantly floors me to see people who proclaim their belief in that do things to innocent people. Now, it is one thing if you want to politic against the BCC and get in fights with the TDC and politic with JLAC and waste taxpayers' money dragging nonsense through the courts. And that may be a gray area on the 401A, but there is nothing gray about withholding those reimbursements for those EMS people. It is against the law. You guys did nothing illegal in voting that money. These people have been through enough. They have been through enough. Every time some nonsense like this gets going, they go right back to the starting line with all of the trauma they went through with being railroaded by this county. And if I had not hired a criminal attorney and gone in and talked to the FDLE and the state's attorney's office, and thank God they were receptive. Earth to everyone, Kate Kinney's record is already expunged. Matt Sullivan was never even up on criminal stuff. Edler just kept fighting, filing garbage on him. And everybody knows it was a setup. And now we've got a clerk of court that is going against the rule of law on the legislative body legally voting reimbursement for these people who have been through hell and back and will never get their old lives back. And our clerk can't even write them reimbursement for a little bit of corner of what they lost. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Next item will be recommendation concerning the agreement for reimbursement of licensing expenses. Public Works, Jane, West. No. Yeah, this is just a housekeeping issue. The original recommendation said to authorize my signature. It should have said to ratify my signature, and this uh, board recommendation will clean that up. Move to approve the item. We have a motion. Second. Second. Please vote by raising your hand. Aye. Passes five unanimous. Thank you. Wes. Item two will be the presentation of the broadband proposals. We have two proposers. First will be ITP, P PCS. They will be given 15 minutes to uh, present, and there will be an, uh, uh, an additional 15 minutes allow for question and answers. Uh, commissioners, you all have a, a score sheet in front of you. You will, uh, once you are satisfied that you've had your, answer, your questions answered and you've listened to the proposals, you will rank those, uh, that proposer based on the weights uh, identified there on the score sheet. And then at the end of the presentations, uh, we will tally those up and we will see. Wes. Yes, sir. We do have one speaker. Do we want to go and get that speaker before we bring them in? Absolutely. Stan McDaniels. Stan McDaniels. Excuse me. What's the wishes of the board? They want to be able to speak after instead of before. I'm good with it if the board's good with it. Okay, that's fine. Okay, let's go with. All right, Jeff, you want to bring the first pre presenter? Hey, uh, sorry. Go ahead. What do you got? I have several things I want to discuss. I don't know if we should save it for afterwards or before, but I. I was not up to speed, obviously, when this first thing came up. I've done a lot of discovery. I have some concerns, but I'll wait till afterwards if you want, or I'll bring them up now. I think, I, uh, well, I mean, I, Commissioner Barry, what's your thoughts? I mean, you're leading this charge. I mean, do you, uh, uh, after, you want Commissioner, to I, th I think we listen to the proposals, go through the ranking scenario, and then once uh, we know who ranks the highest, at that time, there, there should be a motion to give staff direction to enter into an agreement with that proposer. Well, maybe, the only thing, Wes, is I'm not sure time, that we should go to agreement without having all the information. Well, maybe at, the, at that point in time for that recommendation would be the time for that discussion, I do believe. Okay, I'll respect that. Okay, let's bring me in. Let's go. Up 
So we're just gonna put a timer and we'll give each group 15 minutes. Is that for presentations or for presentations and questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's for presentations. There'll be a second 15 minutes allotted for question and answer. Okay. All right. Welcome and the mic is yours and your time has started. Perfect, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here to present in front of the Board of County Commissioners. I'm Guido Dominguez, Project Associate for IBT. I'll be going over a general overview and then giving it uh, the mic over to our respective partners for each part of the application and proposal that we, can, that we put together. A brief agenda, we'll go over the team roles, our company introductions, our proposal highlights, and then go into the actual last mile network with reference to our roadmap and additional funding sources to be able to actually get this going. When it comes to our team roles and responsibilities, we think our proposal is unique in that it brings in three industry leaders in our respective areas. Nokia for fixed network solutions, PCS from the network design, the construction and the maintenance perspective, and IBT from the grant writing and operations of the network. So, without, so with that said, I'd like to pass it over to Randy from Nokia, who'll speak a little bit more about their company. First of all, thank, thank you very much for letting us be here. Uh, my name is Randy Williams. I'm the Southeast Account Manager for Nokia. Uh, iChart is what it is. It just says we have a lot of customers and they're around the world. Uh, all the major carriers, AT&T, Verizon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the major uh, carriers of any type uh, use our gear. Uh, we are the, we're the only solutions provider for broadband for North America. There's only one other company, it's called Huawei, and I, I know that you probably wouldn't buy from Huawei, so uh, we're the one, one company that brings a full solution to the table. Uh, we're going to talk about a private wireless solution today, that's ours. We're going to talk about optical transport, that's ours. We're going to talk about fiber to the home at some point, that's ours. Uh, so what I'm saying to you is Nokia is, is the premier solution provider for broadband in the world. Uh, one of the key things to think about is Bell Labs. You've heard of that. That's, again, one of the premier innovation R&D groups. That's part of Nokia. Nokia is made up of Alcatel, Alcatel Lucent, and then Nokia. So that's, it's a large organization, close to 100,000 employees, $25 billion in sales. Uh, we have the products, we have the solutions, and we have the partners. So we look forward to being a part of, of your, hopefully, movement going forward. We want to earn your business today. We want to earn your business tomorrow. We want to be your partner as we move forward. We are a carrier class product set. Important to say carrier class. That means reliability over time. You know, we're talking about reliability of networks that may have, well, you don't want it to go down. So. Uh, we have a lot of things to talk about, not a lot of time to talk about it. So I'm here. We're here to help you. We want to be your partner. Okay. And I'll turn it over if I had. Hey, good morning, everyone. So my name is Fahad. I work with Nokia. Uh, so on the screen, you might have seen the end-to-end -end architecture, like the, how the equipment will work like. And as uh, Randy was mentioning, we as a Nokia offer end-to-end -end, uh, systems. Like uh, they range from the connectivity, basic connectivity uh, from fixed networks to, and to the last mile devices that includes the mobile phones or the CPEs that are used inside the house, houses. So if you, if you can see, or I don't know, you guys have a presentation in front of you. So, so what we are current, currently offering, we have different variants on the core side or the packet sides. So what we are proposing is the end core that's a simple or the most uh, uh, like uh, as of now, it's most mostly offered on the private wireless spectrum to industries, and it's a very it it reduces the cost of deployment along with uh, it has certain features and functionalities that can be fully upgraded. And then uh, from the deployment aspect, like it's from fiber, uh, like uh, the towers are connected with the radio uh, radio equipment, radio those transmit that the signals are you know in the middle. You can see the houses figures where those end devices are. So th that signal gets transformed there, and with the help of CPEs, uh, users get connected to that. What we offer is more flex flexibility, the ease of uh, uh, installation with the apps. We have uh, state-of-the-art apps that guide uh, users to install the CPEs. It's nothing difficult like uh, presently what we have. It's more simpler and more uh, agile. So having said that, I'll pass on to uh, Rick. Thank you. 
Thanks, Vaughn. Uh, good morning, and uh, my name is Rick Arnold. I'm vice president, uh, license holder, uh, a couple of the licenses for Precision Contracting Services, PCS. Uh, we're Florida-based, family-owned, and operated 32 plus years of building and designing and maintaining networks in exactly the space you guys live in. It's municipal, city, county, state, transportation, um, and that's all we do. Uh, mission critical networks for these particular applications. ISP is obviously something that, that uh, easily is integrated into that and often is, but you know our first, our first task is building a resilient, reliable, um, predictable network, scalable network for our city, county, state transportation customers. Um, that's, that's, it, it, that's the simplest way I can, and I'll talk a little bit because I think some of the uh, comments were, you know, concerns about maintaining and, and building a network. There's a lot of people that can build a network. You want to build a network that doesn't require a lot of maintenance, first of all. But we are also internationally recognized for our capabilities in exactly that mapping, asset tracking, and documentation. Um, that's a, a PCS product, it's called FiberTrack, um, and we do that for uh, many city, county, state customers um, across the southeast. Uh, that is a very intensive uh, sub-meter or better type geolocated network that, that will give you details down to your strand allocation. So, and that's something in the design, we pay very much attention to uh, the allocations for the most efficient use down to a strand level. But in this particular device as a, as a customer, you can select two sections of your network and it will tell you exactly how to patch it through to make that work. In addition, if you have you know updates to gear in the, in, in the remote cabinets and things along those lines, it, you can roll up a list of any switch that may be of a certain rev and it will tell you exactly where it's at so that you can either roll out firmware upgrades and things. It's a, a, it touches a lot of things that get a little bit technical and so I don't have that much time, unfortunately, but certainly from a design, build, maintain perspective, I don't believe that there's another company positioned as we are across the southeast. We're Florida-based, we're here, we're, got, we're not going anywhere. I've got seven offices in Florida and Carolinas and Texas. Um, we would love to be a part of this deployment and I uh, think that we would be a great choice. And I'll uh, pass it off to Daniel. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, Daniel, are you coming up? Uh, no, it's not me. Well, thank you very much. My name is Daniel Toledano. I am with IBT, and we are a leader in implementation of fiber optics and structured cabling for voice and telecommunications, including broadband. Um, we come from the business-to-business -business world, where you know the, there's a true requirement for 24-7 uh, network and customer service uh, availability, um, which means that you know our mission is to please the client. We want to make sure that the client has the best experience, that they're always online. Uh, and you know, nothing more than a critical facility like a hospital needs that. We are serving more than 4,000 customers. We've been in business for more than 10 years. And we do all types of stuff, from fiber to the home, to business internet, uh, voice over IP, and we do it in many different places. We do it in residential buildings. We do it in multifamily buildings. We do it in logistical centers, renewable energy facilities. And what does that mean? <clears throat> that we are able you know, to bring connectivity to underserved or completely not served communities and provide them best in class service. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll give it on to, um, to my colleague Guido. So with all that said, we can go over a little bit about the main points of the proposal highlights. So 
the estimation for the proposal is around $30 million for this first phase um, to be able to build out the network with the full 103-mile backbone, 104-mile backbone, um, while connecting the 40 county sites, dedicating the four tubes to the county, as well as being able to connect nine tower locations from where we'll start the first phase of the private 5G wireless. And the reason we narrowly tailored the scope of our proposal, starting with the fixed wire with the private 5G, is because we understood the funding constraints that the county is facing right now, right? Only having $10 million to allocate for a backbone that is about 109 miles is a limitation. But we want to work with the county to secure additional funding to be able to also build out fiber to the home and use the private 5G solution as an interim solution before we have the full fiber to the home, understanding that the high cost of fiber to the home is going to require these additional funds to come in, and that's going to, get to take some time. As some top line numbers, the way that we have the network currently designed, we cover over 60 percent of the unserved homes that are in the north, uh, northern part of the county, and 92 percent of the unserved locations in the county are within two miles of the fiber backbone. What does this mean? It means that these, the fiber backbone is perfectly situated for us to apply for additional funds and actually be able to do the last mile drops using those additional funds, which I'll discuss. And as I said, we're committed to dedicating the four tubes to the county, as well as net neutrality, open access, strong labor standards, and local hiring. A few more things in terms of the way that we see the deployment. We see that private 5G solution as a way to start to get the ball rolling. But ultimately, we do want to commit to the full fiber to the home package and be able to serve in these unserved locations. Why do we think we're uniquely situated to be able to do that? Well, IBT itself is very experienced with regards to the grant application process and actually operating these grants when it comes to federal and state level programs, including USDA Reconnect and working with the Department of Economic Opportunity and additional funding that we will talk about, uh, that I'll be talking about in a few slides. When it comes to the actual household numbers, this, this network will serve over 2,000 households and businesses with, uh, in the northern part of the county with over 1,500 unserved households. Again, that's more than 60 percent of the current unserved need in the county. With regards to the five, private 5G solution, our pricing will start at $35 per month, but with ACP and Lifeline discounts, that becomes essentially free for those that are within 200 percent of the federal poverty line. And when it comes to fiber to the home, we'll start our pricing at $50 per month for 100 megabits per second symmetrical service and build that fiber to the home network out as we secure the additional funding. Our phasing when it comes to this, fa to this program we're looking at it in about a 24-month cycle. The first six months spent on doing the permitting, the final high-level design for this network, and actually being able to secure these additional funds. That six-month timeline, in the next six months, we'll see multiple different funds opening, such as the Broadband Opportunity Program Round 2, where there's going to be $122 million just for the state of Florida alone. We'll see the Broadband Infrastructure Program under the Capital Projects Fund, where we see that there's $247 million that will be awarded over the next four years. But the end of this year is critical, and the reason for that is because we're going to see bead funding coming into the state, where there's $1.5 billion that's exclusively for the state of Florida, an estimated $1.5 billion, to be able to do these networks. And what's very critical is that the ARPA funds that the county have have been authorized to be used as matching funds for the 25 percent match requirement for this bead funding. So the county is uniquely situated to be able to be thinking about this not as a one-time thing where you start building out the network with only the $10 million you have, but looking for a partner to be able to build more than just what you have with $10 million to build out a full fiber to the no home network that's able to bring internet access into the unserved, underserved areas of the county and then expand into other areas as well. With the additional time that we have left, a few more details. When it comes to the broadband infrastructure program, which should be the first uh, program that's going to be opening up this year under the DEO, the funding there for the $247 million is owed for that four-year time frame. So there will be $60 million allocated every single year with these application processes. Just so you know, we as IBT have already applied for USDA Reconnect rounds three and four, very experienced at the federal level, as well as with the DEO, uh, Department of Economic Opportunity Broadband Opportunity Program that had just closed recently in December, working with two different counties on those applications. So we have the experience and we're looking for a partner with the county because when you do submit these applications as a partnership, the additional points make it that much more critical and more likely that you're actually going to be approved. So our plan isn't just to build this out and take the county money today, it's to build out a network that's going to last, to grow, and to work with the county. With that said, thank you very much. And we're open for questions.
Mr. Chairman, I do have a question. Yes, go ahead, Commissioner. All right. You hit, you know, you, you hit um, the majority of the high points as far as how many households, you know, how much fiber you're actually going to be running during this phase. Um, and it was it was referred to a couple of times, but I presume that the assumption is the with the $10 million allocation, that's the request from the county. So the request from the county is the $10 million okay. allocation. The total project cost is that $30 million. 30 million. Okay. We're going to work with the county to, okay. to secure the additional funding as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see Commissioner May walked away. Any other questions? Mike? I, yeah, I have a couple questions. So the first thing is I need to know your metrics because you put 2,000 households and businesses. Where did you get that number from? That's using the FCC's broadband serviceable locations map. So that's the new data that's come out from November 18th. So and that so would has address level data. Sorry. No, go ahead. So that would mean, according to what I understand, there's 10,600 households north of Muskegee. So you're saying over 20, or close to 20% of the people don't have internet out there? What they have is internet service that's below the 25-3 requirement to be considered served. And the reason for that is because when it comes to the, the federal guidelines for certain of these programs, um, they don't consider unlicensed fixed wireless as served locations. They don't consider speeds below 25.3 as served. And so we're using that as the unserved definition, which meets the federal requirements for the ARPA funding that you all are using. Okay. I like the ACP stuff, but the cost for $30 million for that number is about $20,000 per household. Would that be a good return on investment, you think? So the return on investment is the fact that we're building out the fiber backbone first. So the real issue here is that the fiber backbone doesn't exist in this area and needs to be built out. Now, with the fiber backbone, we're trying to be able to actually connect counties to the 40 county sites as well and give the dedicated fibers to the county. And that's the whole, that's the purpose of being able to partner with the county to do this, right? Because the ARPA funds are supposed to be used for a last mile network or to be able to bring service, but at the same time, we want to bring a service to the county. And I saw where the state funding, and I'm assuming you're, because I was looking into this and I'm not an expert on this, but I think I see Dave Merzen here. I'm assuming you're using the Department of Economic Opportunity grant money to get the rest of this $20 million? Yeah, the goal is to be able to use the Department of Economic Opportunities, multiple different grant programs, as well as federal programs through the national. Have NCAA you applied for that money yet? We've been applying for that money in other areas of the state, but we want we need to partner with the county to be able to make sure that our applications are going to be accepted. Why? The DEO is looking for county buy-in. And so when the county actually buys in, we we have a great connection with not only Katie Smith within the Department of Economic Opportunity, but we've actually helped write the way that the regulations and rules are being created for these opportunity programs. And the number one thing is county buy-in. So in order to be able to apply in these areas, we want to make sure that we have the support of the county and are working closely together. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, sir, go ahead. I just want to clarify for clarification for the way we're going to do this. So we're going to ask questions of this gentleman and then the next team's going to present and we're going to ask questions. But I also want to know that I have the, the ability to ask questions, pull one off the bench, for instance, if I hear something in the next presentation, I want to be able to pull these guys up and ask them. Is that is that I'm, acceptable? Um, Commissioner Baer. Unless Wes or Alice would tell me differently, I would presume after the second presentation and the board discusses, it has the Q&A with the second presenter, mm -hmm. that then both presenters would be able to come in here that's, to discuss. That's kind of, I'm just making sure. I mean, that I this was my only job. crack at the... Uh, at Everybody's the nodding, so right. I presume that's the case. Once. Once both discussions are had individually and the board can Q&A with them without anybody else in the room, then every when we talk amongst ourselves, everybody comes back. Yep, That's yep. What I'm and, and I do have one question for the gentleman. Okay, so I, in looking at the presentations and the, and the proposals before, I was I thought we were in like the six point two million dollar range. Um, was there was there some was that a misunderstanding on my part? Did that number to ten million grow? We had seen from the. FAQs that were responded to mm -hmm. um, during the initial solicitation. The response from the county was that there were ARPA funds that were allocated and the county was looking to use as much as $10 million of their own funds. But we don't, want to, we don't necessarily want to use it all. I mean, No, might. understandable, of course. So, so was there ever a, a number of $6.2 million that your team was going to? Is that? Is that I, got two, I got two different ones. I got one for 6.2 and one for 6.5. So it's always 10 million with you? It always has been? Well, we've, we've been hearing from the county that there's 10 million allocated, and we're just telling you how far that 10 million can go. Right. And um, it, 
what do you anticipate the take rate will be when we, he talked about 10,000 houses? What, what's, what's your estimation of the take rate? Is it 20%, the 2,000 no. houses? So in those unserved areas, you, we, we've, we've experienced higher take rates closer to the 50%. Mm. Um, and we really do believe that, especially when you are the only wired solution in these mm -hmm. areas, as you build fiber to the home, those take rates can actually go up and exceed 60, 70% in many of these cases, especially when you consider the affordable uh, connectivity program bringing down the, the cost. And, and if we do this and we and just say we, we selected you guys, we partnered with you, we gave you the 10 million, and for some reason you were unsuccessful at getting any additional state or federal money, does that mean we're dead in the water at that point unless we come up with it? How, what would we're, your... we're experiencing bringing in additional funding also as well. I, I hear that, but no, I'm no. saying worst case scenario, it doesn't happen. No, Some no, no, I didn't mean for, yeah. I, on the private side as well is what I was going okay. to say. Yeah. We're experiencing bringing in additional funding. As a matter of fact, that's how IBT started. Daniel, if you would like to speak a little bit more as to that point. Well, the, there, there are a number of ways to bring in funding. <clears throat> um, and again, what you really need is the fiber backbone. That's gonna bring, what's, that's what's gonna light your network and then you can distribute it to the last mile to every home through a fiber to the home solution or through a 5G wireless, very stable solution. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing here is growing over time. The solution we're presenting today is a solution that can yield results in 24 months. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, if you wanna do fiber to every home from day one, we're looking at a you know, five to 10 year program, maybe you know, somewhere in between. And that will require many, a, a, a high multiple uh, in terms of, of, of amounts required. So if there's less funding, uh, we can apply for more funding. If we're not successful, like you were asking, um, what would happen is, you know, we would have to, you know, sort of design the network in a way so where the backbone is, you know, more limited. But whatever we do is something that we can build on. Whatever we do is something we can continue growing on. Uh, and again, all of the infrastructure funds, but you can see on the on the lats, on the on the mm -hmm. very last line, you know, mm -hmm. the bead funds, those are not going to be made available until you know the end of of next year. So we are extremely optimistic that, you know, with the amount of private investment and you know federal investment that's going to flow, um, you know, partnering with you know with with you know with you, essentially would allow us to access the funds. So, so funding, you know, we're seeing a once in a generational opportunity sure. to connect every home. No, I agree with that. So once you, um, once we complete this, whoever gets the deal, are you, is your team prepared to also um, bid on the Southern phase, the phase that covers the rest of the county? We, we would love the opportunity to do so, of course. And, and, and by the way, we, you know, we would all, always have economies of scale. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. We would always have, yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, I'm not an expert in this field at all, far from it. Um, I, you know, but I know that there's mm -hmm. other technology out there, and I spoke to a gentleman who's very, very adept at this yesterday, and um, I asked him about the Starlink. The Starlink's about a thousand bucks per home, a hundred bucks a month, between a hundred and two hundred a month. Doesn't get you the speed that you guys could give, but for two thousand houses, we could do it for three point six million, and that's a Starlink to every single person that wants to take it. Um, so. Why would I, why, I and I'm just playing devil's advocate here. I'm not trying to hit you over the head, but we're spending it. We're about to spend a hell of a lot of money yeah. and it's good stuff. I'm, I've been supportive all the way through and I continue to be, but what would you say to someone who says, why not just deploy Starlink yeah. and save, you know, $7 million? So, so I'll start by the very basic at the end of the day, you know, a regular citizen doesn't need to be an expert. They just want their internet to work all Absolutely. the time really fast. So I would start by that. Mm -hmm. And then you, it's, it's all a relationship between investment mm -hmm. and stability. So there's nothing like a wired connection. Sure. If you want to do a fiber to the home solution, it's going to be by far the most expensive because it means that you need to dig a directional bore to every house in the county. And some houses may be very remote and connecting some of the houses. I, I, I think Mr. Kohler was asking if 20,000 per home was a reasonable investment. There are places in, in, in Alaska that we're seeing that costs several hundred thousands of dollars to get them connected. So, so, so what we're doing is, the idea is we're, we're doing the backbone that you always need, and that's gonna be the rock solid, reliable source of internet. And from there, how do you distribute? This is very similar to electricity, right? You have the high voltage line, and from then you do the, the last mile distribution. That, la that last mile distribution can be done in two ways. It can be done with a physical fiber optics wire, mm -hmm. or it can, can be done with the latest and greatest Nokia 5G 
wireless connection. Okay, the same one let me know. stop you right there yeah. because this is the last question I have for you because it's all about speed, right? Yeah. You got DSL where it's terrible and then you got broad. Yeah. So tell me about the speed difference between um, the, the wireless solution that you're talking about and then the actual last mile, last mile buried fiber to the house. What's yeah. the difference? So last mile buried fiber to the house can go up to two gigabits and with further improvements and further network upgrades, mm -hmm. you know, it's essentially unlimited at some point going forward. Today, okay. it's one to two gigabits one to two for gigabits. most commercially okay. available solutions. Your wireless solution would be? The, the wireless solution that we have, the base would be 150 over 50. Um, but it can it continues to grow significantly. We're so now, it's significantly less than what it's. A, but but it's plenty for ninety nine percent of the users. Mm. Now we have now this is now we have five G. I'm, I'm I'm getting very technical, but there's five G over three point five gigahertz. But there is a new uh, spectrum opening up at the FCC. It's already actually opened up the six gigahertz. That should be able to increasingly. Um, grow the speed. So both solutions are solutions that can grow. With the satellite that you were asking about Starlink, mm -hmm. the issue is that with this five, I mean, with the wire, you have it in your house. So mm -hmm. there's sure. really no distance. With the 5G, your antenna is a mile away. Mm -hmm. With the satellite, you're several miles away. So there's many things that can interrupt, uh, interrupt that connection. Starlink is a revolutionary solution. I am a personal fan of the solution. But I would say that that's for the very, 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 uh, you know, far away, um, farm, remote, 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 remote farm. But what's, if the, what's the speed? What's the speed on that Starlink? So it's it's about a hundred bucks. If you wanna, it's, no, sorry, no, it's hundred megs. Sorry, it's hundred megs for hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. But if you wanna do the super high, fast speed, you're talking a lot more money. You're talking five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars a month. You know, and that's only for like cruise ships or sure. for commercial okay, buildings. I appreciate the answers. Thank you. Commissioner Binder. Thank you. Uh, so the the timeline uh, from what we're hearing is that, uh, so this this appears first proposal is to um, get the backbone and do the the Nokia wireless to the home. Correct. And that's gonna take 24 months. That'll be in the 24 month timeline, correct? Okay. What's what's the, the, the next, I mean, that next phase of, of getting the wired, what does that look like and, and yeah, so the reason that there, it really, it depends on a couple of things and it depends on the county's priorities. I think this map shows us a good amount that we can talk about. The first thing is the way we did the proposal, we said that the full backbone was asked of in the RFP. But if only part of the backbone were to be connected, you can get up, we can get upstream service through the to only the northern part um, along by century and coming down and doing only that first part and you can do that fiber construction as backbone do it in a faster timeline and then use additional funds to be able to do fiber to the home. You know, the real big question is what areas are we designing and how many route miles are we doing? That really determines the, the speed at which we can do it. As we get additional funding, we're anticipating that we can do it concurrently with the backbone construction. So as our backbone is being constructed, we are able to, if we have additional funding for doing the last mile drops on fiber to the home, be doing the construction at the same time. Rick, do you have anything else on the construction side? Not particularly, no, I, I will add that, I mean, the, the time frames obviously that we've got in here are such that, you know, we're gonna uh, under promise and over deliver. I mean, that's just the way I think all of us roll on the team. So they can be escalated a lot of that in, into some of the earlier conversations. Everybody's familiar with, you know, the supply chain issues and such. And we, we feel as a team and us specifically as a company are way better prepared and equipped to deal with some of those delays which help keep projects moving. Because as I said, we live in this space, timing is not, you know, you try to bring a fire station or a police station online, it's kind of a big deal. We need to be able to respond in a timely manner, so. Right. And well, Randy, yeah. I, again, I, we're, we're close to, to your last minute and I do have one more question. Oh, yes sir, I have another question. I'll make it real quick. Yeah. Well, we, well, we're going to have to either cut it off, guys, or we're going to have to extend it to the next group because I, I, time is I'd up rather about up. I'd rather extend it. No problem. Okay. I'd rather get well, this answered. Go ahead, go ahead sir. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. I was going to say, this, this is the first step. Uh, this is the first step to get uh, internet to your users out in the county. But from a Nokia standpoint, we're, we're delivering 10 gig pond. That's the fiber to the home today. We've started delivering 25 gig symmetrical. Uh, to Chattanooga EPB, which is kind of the, the golden 
a place to go see if you want to see it. We just demonstrated a 100 gig pond last year at Fiber Connect in Nashville. Award for that. That's probably several years off, but the technology is moving. It's not going to stay the same. So if you build the infrastructure, i.e. the backbone, then you start moving out from that backbone. Over time, you're going to grow this network. So this is the first step. We see it, and partnerships will make that thing work, but technology is moving. We're on, the, we're on the leading edge of that, and you can be too. Perfect, thank you. Uh, also, in terms of uh, pricing, so, uh, I mean, here on the bottom of the slide, you, you have starting at $50 per month. I didn't see that in the proposal. It was more of the, the standalone, uh, I mean, it was, it was more of the- um, The private 5G solution. The private 5G solution. So I, I just wanted to, to clarify that, although the, I'd say the charts between our two uh, are a little different. The the product level it looks like for the starting is is 50 for each. So uh, I, I just want to clarify that 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 the so the the retail price that's in their proposal for fiber to the home is for fiber to the home is is through the the wireless the 5G thing. So uh, it's, the, it's not are, an apples to apples comparison. The, the so yeah. So the so the proposal itself illustrates the speeds for the private 5G solution. We also wanted to talk about the fiber to the home that we have built in other areas and we are prepared to build here after securing mm -hmm. additional funding. And the purpose of that is because we were under the impression as the way the RFP was written that we had to focus on the backbone and then try to keep our costs as low as possible. Now, in doing that, that's why we first proposed the private 5G solution so you can actually be lighting up customers because the impression of the RFP was that you had to build the full backbone. You couldn't just say that you're going to build part of it. And so because of that, we understood that we had the funding constraint. Now, this price for fiber to the home is something that we've deployed in other areas, right? And so this is actually something that we can do if we do the fiber to the home through additional funding by doing the last mile drops, or if for some reason the backbone gets scaled back and the funding that we have available goes into that last mile deployment. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Coley. I have one more question. It has to do with the future of Nokia. So do you have a plan to do satellite down the road? Because you know that's your competitor, and, and some of these folks will want to be remote with their wireless moving. Uh, is there any thought of that, adding that to your business plan? We're doing a lot. Uh, Bell Labs, we're, in fact, we're going to be putting a, a private wireless We've already contracted with NASA and put pri private wireless on the moon, so that's kind of where we're looking. But uh, a lot of the intellectual properties of all the technologies belong to Bell Labs. Oh. So yes, in many ways. So uh, we're looking at a lot of different things. I can't say yes or no on specifically will we have the product there, but part of the product will be us. Okay, thank you very but much. If it's going to happen, we're going to be part of it. Simple. All right, appreciate the answer. Thank you, Commissioner Collin. Just a couple quick questions, and not nearly as technical as these other guys. Um, so what's your training program? You're going to come in, and there's going to be um, probably in excess of $100 million by the time we finish with state, federal, and local funding. So I guess a couple questions. Uh, you know, do you have a training program? How do you hire? What's your commitment to local inclusion and diversity with small and minority contractors? Do you all have any plans or any programs that you have implemented for that? That's a, a daily uh, task for us as a company across the southeast. So for, for PCS, and, and I believe everybody else is going to be relatively close, we're probably the smallest of Nokia and IBT. But our training uh, policies and procedures are, are pretty rigid. They're, they're very much directed with our manufacturer partners. Uh, we carry certifications from the, we have people that sit on the committees that, that write the standards for what gets deployed. Um, the manufacturers recognize us for what we do and they devote the time to come physically train. We have trained the trainer programs within our, our company. So right. y'all partner with like the local community colleges or the we do. technical so trainings? We do. Have, we have sponsored uh, photonics and other types of efforts within a lot of the community colleges uh, where they've been, you know, where they've had programs that would allow that, where we actually come in, help contribute to the curriculum for, for the students that come through. We do, uh, you know, ongoing recruiting training. We have a, a plan within the company where that, that the, the path for a person that comes through the company can start as an installer and end up as a network technician or uh, even, you know, admin if, if they're so suited for it. We 
typically promote from within, uh, and very seldom do we go out and hire uh, to to jump other people. But the training, I can you could, you know, ask any of the uh, team members, and they will tell you that we spend more time and money on training than any company they've ever. That's right. I, I would just like if, if any of you companies could, you know, within your mission statements or within your plans, uh, any of your training programs that you've already implemented, that would be very beneficial to me. We could certainly document that. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know that anybody's taking it to that level, but certainly we have no problem doing that. All right. Well, it would, for me, I mean, understanding that although you have state and federal dollars, you have a lot of local dollars and we have a commitment to. I have a commitment. I can't speak for the other four guys. I have a commitment uh, to, for to have an inclusion for our, our local and small. And oh, we have, you know, in God we trust. All others just put it on the dotted line, and, and we just write it down and show that commitment. Is kind of you know, for me to vote for someone, I would have to see that. No, ab absolutely. We've got relationships that I would be happy to share where we do have um, arrangements in certain cities where they there's in, there's firms that are doing training, especially, especially in some of the underserved areas. Uh, where folks are looking for opportunities, they will get them to a point, vet them to the point where we can actually bring them on board in, in some capacity. Well, yeah, we this brought me to me, and I, you know, not nearly familiar as these guys, but the opportunity for workforce training, workforce development, uh, particularly for Huge. young people who don't have to go get degrees. I mean, this is a golden opportunity. And, uh, we had ST Aerospace who came in, and that was one of the commitments was to do to work with our technical school and to work with our community college uh, to do the training because even after the, the broadband's implemented, uh, we have to make sure people are gainfully employed to be able to afford that. I, I can <laughs> commit from our perspective, we, we would be all in for a program. In, in what percentage area. of locals do you think you would hire? On, oh, the, uh, what percentage of local companies or local workforce do you think you would have on this it project? Would be for for this, aside from you know our our typical corporate oversight and stuff, it would be all direct self reform people from the area. That's how we operate in every city state that we're. So you'd in. say ninety percent die okay. easily. Yeah, easily. Okay. All right, and I just would love to see whatever plan you guys have uh, in place uh, for diversity and inclusion uh, for your workforce. Okay. That, thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, sorry, I have one, one last question. Um, uh, underground, above ground, what, what are we looking at? We do both. The proposal was that they wanted the network underground. That's always our recommendation. However, we've got areas of the country that is more pre pre predominantly aerial. Uh, so we do that out of every facility. Our intent is to underground everything that we do, so 100 unless unless we are partnered with you know a, a utility or something that has pole attachment agreements and routes that are easily navigable, and and meet the criteria meet our criteria for resiliency and stuff. But our first path is always underground. Okay, thank you, All right, Commissioner Bear. And, and that's the 109 miles that's included in this first phase. Correct. Yes. Okay. Right. Thank you guys for your presentation. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if you would, for the second presenter, allow them up to 25 minutes of Q&A at the end, not to exceed 25 minutes, would be appropriate. Yeah. Uh, as chairman, you just can't control, you, I mean, you, you can't control your board. Yeah, equal playing field. I mean, yeah. It's playing out 15 minutes, they just go, <laughs> I mean, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean. You see how that feels, Lumen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tried, I mean, the rule was 15, I mean, but. And Jeff, you know my rule. Once, once we start going over, I mean, we'll all miss lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're gonna be here all day. <laughs> so while we're waiting on them, I, I guess you know, Commissioner Perry, and I know this has kind of been you know you've been the lead on this. We'll listen to this group, and then we'll listen to our, our um, speakers, and then we'll have some debate and try to have a decision. Yeah, so I, mean, I just don't want to drag it out all day. Yeah, I mean, well. you know. No, I don't think that's the case. Um, um, I would think we would hear, you know, hear whatever their presentation is or whatever they're, you know, speaking to the board. The board could Q and A with them for a little while, then hear from, you know, hear, f then at that point in time have everybody come out, and then have our public speaker, and then I would like the floor for a couple minutes after that, and then All right. hopefully go for that. Be happy to give it to you. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Ryan Campbell. I am the CEO of Escambia River Electric Cooperative. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I would like to start off with a little information 
about our cooperative and why I feel we are perfectly positioned to help bring broadband to Escambia County residents. We are a nonprofit electric utility that came about in the late 1930s because it was too expensive to bring electricity to rural areas. Through grants and low interest loans, electric cooperatives all across the nation were able to bring electricity to rural areas of America. Does this sound familiar? It's the same problem we're discussing this morning, just with a different service. Prior to the Escambia County request for proposal, EREC sent out an RFP of our own. Our intention was to incentivize communication companies to provide this much needed service to all of the EREC service area while we continue to concentrate on what we do best, provide reliable and affordable electricity. While we did receive one proposal wanting to take advantage of the $1 poll attachments and negotiated MEC ready costs, which were identified as the two most common barriers for bringing broadband internet into rural areas, it was evident their interest was to only serve the most densely populated areas while rural areas would continue to be unserved. If that were allowed to happen, it would make it financially impossible for any company to come in later to serve the most rural areas. For this reason, it was imperative that 100% of our members were served. In order to ensure all EREC members would have access to the service, we chose to move forward with Connects on Connect as a provider partner. EREC will own and maintain the fiber network while Connects on Connect will provide the internet services to 100% of our membership in Escambia County. Because EREC will own the physical fiber wires on the pole, we are able to guarantee that all members in Escambia County will have high-speed, reliable broadband internet available to them. Together, we plan to provide multi-gigabit, reliable, and affordable fiber to the home broadband to 100% of our Escambia County membership. This network will have the capability to provide 10 gigabit symmetrical broadband to every home and business, as well as the 28 county facilities that reside in our service area. As you are aware, in an electric cooperative business model, the electrical infrastructure is owned by our members. Why am I emphasizing this point? EREC is proposing a similar structure for our fiber network. The network will be owned by our membership, making it a community owned asset. Awarding funding to EREC is as close as you can get to putting tax dollars back in the pockets of Escambia County residents. We feel this is a unique and compelling differentiator of our proposal. Our membership uh, represents the largest population of underserved and unserved broadband locations in the county. An award to EREC assures that families most in need will have access to the fastest and most reliable high-speed broadband in the country. This network deployment will dramatically improve the digital divide that exists in the county today. EREC plans to build approximately 600 miles of fiber network, reaching over 4,000 electric member locations with an estimated cost of $24 million. We are seeking $6.3 million of support from the county. If awarded this funding, we expect to have the network completed to all 4,000 locations by mid-2024 targeting first service availability as early as Q3 of this year. EREC will provide dedicated fibers along the route connecting the 28 facilities in the EREC footprint. Since this fiber is only part of the ring design outlined in the RFP to connect all the county facilities, EREC will work with recipient of phase two to find a common meeting point at the edge of EREC footprint where we can connect our dedicated fiber ring to the phase two recipients ring. The responsibility of the county during construction is to work in good faith with EREC and our construction contractors to help facilitate the speedy deployment of the fiber network. Expediting permitting and other approvals will be crucial to ensure we meet our cost objectives and will ultimately speed up availability of service to residents. I would like to spend a few minutes discussing the details of our plan. Connects on Connect is an industry leading expert in fiber deployment, project management, and broadband operations. Connects on Connect powered by EREC Fiber, will be the internet service provider operating on the EREC Fiber network and offering broadband service to Escambia County residents. Connexon is working with over 80 electric cooperatives across rural America to deliver fiber to the home broadband. They exclusively build fiber in rural communities, so they are very familiar with the unique challenges of building in a rural environment. They are also conscious of the need for broadband affordability their pricing is some of the most competitive across the country. They offer three tiers of residential service, 100 megabit symmetrical, which is same speed up and down, for $49.95 per month, one gigabit symmetrical for $79.95 per month, and two gigabit symmetrical for $99.95 per month.
No contracts, no promotional rates, and no gimmicks. Connects on Connect also participates in the Federal Affordable Connectivity Program that provides a $30 monthly subsidy to families that have household income less than two times the poverty line, which amounts to approximately $55,000 per year. The demographics of our membership indicate that a little less than half of our membership will be eligible to take advantage of that program. That subsidy would put the 100 megabit service at $19.95 per month, 1 gig at $49.95, and 2 gig at $69.95. Connexon also offers residential and business phone service, as well as access to DirecTV stream video packages. We are excited about the opportunity to serve our community and help eliminate the digital divide that exists in Escambia County today. This fiber network will improve the lives of residents, enable work from home employment opportunities, provide growth for local businesses, and stimulate economic development. I'm glad to know that no matter which way the board votes today, the most rural citizens of Escambia County will have access to high-speed broadband internet available to them. My hope is that in the future, there will not be any areas in rural America that will have to ask if broadband internet is available prior to purchasing a home or a property. It will be as common and as automatic as electricity and running water. Because of the nature of the cooperative model, rural electric cooperatives all across the nation are making this a reality. We look forward to adding yet another service to our offering in Northern Escambia County. Thank you for your willingness to help solve the problem, and thank you for giving me your time this morning to present our solution to you. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, board? Uh, good morning. Thank you for that presentation. I got some of the same questions I asked the previous um, business. How many actual individual people do you believe are affected by this? Do you believe the last number is 1,500 in, in the, from Muskegee to the Alabama line that are actually in the underserved right now? Well, the actual number of people is different than the locations that may be served because you have farmers up there that have a barn and they don't want just internet in their house. They want it at their barn too. They want it at their tractors. They want it at that. So locations is different than people. So how, so what, what, give me a number. What do you so think? So we have over 4,000 locations that we're going to service. So you're saying 4,000. And probably. Now, I, hold on, I have a follow up on that because sorry. you say 4,000. How many of those do you believe will actually sign up? There's a difference. You can have it there, but do you have a swag on how many people actually compete and sign up with your, with your broadband? Um, so we haven't sent out a survey, obviously, but we submitted. Um, Probably 30% is what we did in our numbers just for complete uh, conservative so you, numbers. You say 30%? We're expecting in our numbers, we yeah, use 30%, 30%, but okay. we're expecting closer to 60 or 70. But we wanted to make sure the numbers worked at 30 before we jumped in. Okay. You wanted $6.3 million from the county. Where's the other $18 million going to come from? Is it going to come from this Department of Economic um, uh, Opportunity? Uh, we Money. did apply for state funds, but most of it's going to be low interest loans through uh, CFC, which is a cooperative that uh, loans out uh, money to electric cooperatives. It's a finance cooperative. Okay. I have a second question. I went to your website last night look, looking for this. You, you guys advertise that you do Viasat Internet. We do. And at your $100 per month rate, you meet the standards for what the federal requirements are for this ARPA money. Yes, sir. This is a satellite. What would happen with this? Would you still offer this to your customers? We would not. So there are other areas or other um, companies in our area that we would uh, pass it along to. Uh, I don't know if that would be a gift or a sale. I haven't looked into that yet. I didn't want to get the cart before the horse. Uh, but no, if we're going in fiber, there's no reason for us to do both. The reason we offer Viasat is so at least rural people would have something right. because they have nothing right now in some areas. Would it cheaper just to pay you to 4,000 people to have Viasat? Well, the Viasat, have you ever used Viasat? No, but I've had, I've used some of these satellite internets when I was in Guantanamo Bay and in Italy and Japan, and they're pretty good. They're getting better all the time. Um, I don't know what Viasat is, but I know what satellite internet is, and it's gotten substantially better since 2011. It has, yes. So it will put you on the internet, but it is not going to close the digital divide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, Jeff, sure. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Thanks. First, uh, thank you for being here, putting together this presentation. I love the idea that you're local and that uh, it'd be an employee-owned or a co cons uh, constituent-owned um, operation. Um, the total cost again was 6.3. Is that your? That's what you're. 24 million was the cost. We're asking for 6.3. From, from the county. From yes, our, sir. From 6. our property. Okay. 
And then uh, another thing that I'm very, uh, that I like to hear is you're talking about getting loans to complete some of the deployment. Let me ask you something. If, if none of this federal or state money from DEO came through, would you commit to going that full route uh, and getting loans to, to complete the project? I just want to know what happens if, you, if, the, if these grants don't come through. And I've asked, I'm going to ask both companies that. Right. So our board has approved that assuming we get this from the county that we will move forward. So the other I would say is icing and we really prefer to have it. Obviously. Absolutely. Uh, our membership is on the hook for the loans, you know, no matter what it is, because they own us. We're not for profit. We don't have a nest egg of money that we can go dig out of in a bank account to build this. So it will all be loans if we don't uh, uh, get anything else from the state. But our vo board has voted to move forward with just this uh, award. Okay, and let's talk about the speeds. Your, your model, so far as I understand, is you're going to take the fiber to each individual uh, member of your co-op? Yes, sir. Even, regardless of whether or not they take the service. Now, um, if they have a quarter mile long driveway, we will probably leave it at the end of the driveway sure. unless they take service. But other than situations like that, we will be at every home regardless of if they take service. So there will be no wireless component to there what you're doing? There will be no be wireless doing. component, okay. no, sir. And let me talk, let me ask about your speeds. What, uh, I know that you put in a, a chart in here, but um, what, what will your, um, you've got 100 uh, megabits per second for 49.95, is that right? That's in your presentation? Yes, sir. So how much would it cost for a gig? Is that the $99 plan? I believe the one gig is cheaper than the $99. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the yeah, one gig bit is $79.95 and the two gig bit is $99.95. And um, you, you're pretty confident you'll be able to offer that speed with the way you've designed this network? Absolutely. Okay. Um, the other thing that you mentioned in your presentation that, I, that I'm happy about was just your willingness to work with the phase two, because there will be a phase two. My understanding is your company is not going to bid phase two. Correct. Okay, but you're going to work with who, whomever it is, Cox, C Spire, whoever these guys. Correct. Uh, we see this as a service. This is not a business we're trying to get into. This is a service we're trying to serve our members. So we have no interest in going outside of our territory other than maybe if there's a couple houses here or there that maybe falls by the wayside sure. from somewhere else's proposal, we may branch out just a little, but we're, we have no interest in becoming a communications company. And I thought I heard you say you can get this thing going as soon as the third quarter of this year. Uh, yes, sir. Service as soon as the third quarter, depending okay. on hurricanes. Depend. I mean, you know, the obvious stuff. But yes, my, sir. My final question to you is: um, obviously, this is a significant amount of money—six point three million um, plus the additional money you're going to spend. But um, kind of tagging on to what my counterpart, uh, Commissioner Kohler, said. I know that there's existing satellite technology out there, and I, I'm not picking on you. I'm devil's advocate here because I'm not an expert in this field. Um, and of course, that technology is improving, and it. Even if you take the six million or you take the 24 million and divide it by the number of houses, um, it's a significant amount of money and it could be done a lot cheaper if we popped a satellite at every, when you're looking at the taxpayers, we have to answer the taxpayers. Why wouldn't we go that route and save a ton of money? Is it all about the speed? Uh, it's not just about the speed. It's about something called uh, jitterate, I believe it's called. I'm not an IT guy. I'm an engineer. Help, help me jitterate. Understand. So the speed at which it goes up and down, not just the speed at once you hit download, it starts downloading. Mm -hmm. So there's no gaming. There's no. Uh, there's very little streaming. Uh, oh, really? You can stream a little on some of the. Uh, the I actually have Viasat at my house because that's what I have available to me. Yes. I can stream Netflix. I cannot stream any of the others, and I believe that's because of the way that they filter things. I'm not real sure. So I, I have a hard time at quits and buffers. Uh, so it's it's the jitter speed. And, and I may not be completely around that. Like I said, I'm not an IT guy, but the jitter speed is, is the problem with satellite internet. There's a reason why people in the city don't have satellite internet or sure. people close. If you have access to broadband, it is a much superior product. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for your answers. Thank you. Uh, go yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, just re go over the timeline again. So in, in two years, we're completely fiber to the home, uh, things like that. We're expecting a year and a half again, barring major hurricanes, you know, weather events, that kind of thing. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, and so the, is the, the backbone underground? It is not. The backbone will be on our poles, which is why we're able to do it at such speeds. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, of course, when, when hurricanes do hit, um, What's the the plan to make those repairs? Uh, again, because I mean it's a significant investment that we're making in in, in doing it. Um, so who's going to be responsible for for those? We are going to be responsible for putting it back in the air. They can't use broadband if they don't have electricity anyway, and electricity is in the air. So we didn't see that as being a roadblock. But I mean, what about cost for infrastructure? I mean, I, I guess you're already doing the poles again and things like that. But I mean, what about fiber and 
Um, it will be no different than a normal storm because uh, we are an electric cooperative. We're, I may step away from this a little. Oh, okay. Um, because we're electric cooperative, we are eligible for FEMA funds afterwards, so that will help out a little bit, but it will be up to us and uh, to, to you know, put them back in the air. It will be up to us to pay for that, yes. And I, I guess part of my concern, though, would, would be, I mean, that would ultimately be passed on to the consumer, though, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. I will say our goal is to not have any money, now this is the goal, to not have any money out of our electric memberships uh, pockets. So this award today will help us have some to pay off debt service as we go and literally zero dollars out of theirs because of the lease payment we were able to negotiate with Connects on Connect. So our goal is to not charge more to our electric membership. Our goal is to actually use the money that we have incoming because we're not for profit to help subsidize the electric side of things. I just Ask ball up. Sorry, I was about to yeah, go. No, go ahead. Thanks. Go, I mean, go. Um, so, you know, sorry, after Sally, I was focused on down here. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, south of Nine Mile. Um, what what type of damage do you guys have? Did you have in Sally? I mean, it's, um, you know, what type of, um, you, you know, I mean, how, how many times do you have uh, power go out because of uh, fallen limbs and things like that? Um, you know, what's your down rate because of, of being above ground? So I believe it's three nines and then eight, seven percent. So 99.9987 percent reliable. Um, after Sally, we did have 95 percent of our membership out of power. We had them back on uh, in less than five days. And uh, we, we have a great network of other electric cooperatives that we bring in help. And part of that help is going to hang this back on the pole and get it restored. And then we will come back later and permanent back on the pole. So we just temporary it up front. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, one follow up? Yeah, go right ahead, sir. Sir, um, I, I also, I, I've heard that, um, and I like everything about your presentation, but I, my understanding is that there was some uh, public proclamations made that regardless of whether or not there's any funds, you guys were gonna implement this service in the northern portion of Scambi and Santa Rosa County, regardless of any uh, governmental funds. Can you explain um, if, if there's truth to that? Because I have some folks that have told me they heard um, representatives from EREC say that. Um, that is not true. Our that board, is not true. Our board okay. approved this under the assumption that we got this. Okay. And we actually did not sign the contract with Connexon until we awarded this the first time. Uh, and then we were assigned, uh, or we signed that contract with them. And of course, we're, we're back okay. here now. But that, that's the reason why it was according to getting this. So if, if none of this money was out, none of this ARPA money, none of this broadband rural stuff, you guys didn't have a plan, an RFP on the street to move forward with providing this to your, to your members. That we had an RFP on the street to help others because like I said in my speech, um, pole attachment rates yes. and make ready costs, which is changing out a pole to have proper clearances mm -hmm. was the largest uh, obstacle in the way of other companies coming in. So we did put out an RFP that says, hey, we'll work with you on that. We'll charge $1 pole attachment for three years to help get you profitable. So we were trying to bring in other companies because we're a power company. But, uh, and, but there was no guarantee that was gonna happen. Did you get any people, uh, you get any takers on that? We did get one, as I mentioned in presentation, mm -hmm. but it was, um, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was where economically a feasible. Is so in other words, it wasn't gonna serve all your members. They were not, and that okay. was a requirement for us to go on the hook with the money. Yes. Okay, I appreciate that, I appreciate Thank that you. answer. Thank you. Sorry, I had one quick question. Um, the, uh, on the rates, What's what's the the commitment on on maintaining the, that fifty dollars? Uh, we have zero plans, so all that is uh, brought about. Connects on Connect uh, is the one who sets those, and they've got no plans of raising that. Now, obviously, as inflation hits ten years down the road, it will most likely be higher, as will everything else. But we have no plans of raising that right now. It's not a promotional rate. It's not a gimmick. This is what we charge right now. Okay, so it's not, and, and just. You know, it looked like the other one was it was a three years and then it could go up CPI plus one percent. So we have no, you know, no so plans of doing any of that. Like it could be like five dollars increase in five years. Um, so, OK, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, on the, the fiber, the actual build part. So it's almost 600 miles total. Yes. And I mean, I know you were talking about the backbone being aerial, but the, the proposal did include like 175 miles that, that is underground? Right, anywhere we have underground power right now, we will go underground with the broadband. Okay, so if you, you know, kind of break it out, it's you know, 175 maybe that's gonna be underground and then 400, 400 something that's gonna be in the air. Um, and the reason that the county facilities would be in the air is that we don't have underground fiber 
connecting those already. That's Correct. the that's the rationale there. Yes, sir. All right, but it still totals just under 600 miles of fiber, and mm -hmm. you know the the cooperative nature of it is certainly appealing. I mean, that's uh, uh, you know that's something that is made up of uh, you know is made up of my constituents. Uh, you know, often um, you know often we have things that cross you know cross district lines. This is not necessarily you know one of those. This is uh, you know. Uh, exclusive to District 5, but the cooperative nature of it is attractive, and and part of the also part of the proposal also outlined that you're going to have a separate LLC to manage the Escambia County project that includes the Escambia County uh, constituency, Escambia County members, and then if and when you move forward in Santa Rosa County, you'll do likewise over there, so that the Escambia County money will be restricted to the LLC that contains the Escambia County residents? Uh, I don't know if we would do two separate ones, but the Escambia County money would be spent okay. before that because, you know, we're getting an award over here and that is the plans right now is to move forward in Escambia County. We're, uh, we haven't announced anything to, for uh, Santa okay. Rosa County. That is an option later, especially if this is received very well and we're very successful with it. Right. Um, okay, Mr. Chairman, I'm, that's, yes, that's, that's good for questions for me. And like I said, I, I think we do have a speaker and after the speaker, I would, you know, ask for a few minutes. I don't want to say anything now that you know, kind of compares the proposals, but I do have some of those comments maybe once everybody's back in the room. Right, I appreciate that. And so I know you guys are a local co-op and kind of ran by the people. So I would assume that most of your subcontractors would be local. Um, Connects on Connect is doing the project management of that. We will try to find local subcontractors, but because we will ramp up to about 25 miles per week at one point, there's no way to do all local. Oh, but what percentage would you have local? Uh, anybody who wants to uh, bid on the project will have, you know, availability of winning the project. Yeah, and with, I understand with that. Preference I'm for local. Is, is there a targeted number? Do you have a goal? Uh, I don't have that because they're the project manager. Okay, that would I be, can get that for you. Yeah, that would be. I mean, in all fairness uh, to the last group and to your group, I mean, you know, the commitment to local and the, the diversity and inclusion to local and to minorities and women. I mean, that would be. A part of what I would want to know uh, before I would vote for a final contract. Okay, I don't um, have the exact number, but I'm positive that that's going to be given preference because locals are cheaper. You're not having to pay per diem or anything right. else. So you know, even on nothing else but just looking at money, mm -hmm. they're going to be cheaper anyway. So I know they will be given a preference. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, that would so I. Um, I would just like to get that information and the okay. commitment. I mean, I would like to know your training program because this is going to, you're obviously here. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's very important, particularly in the North End coming out of Century and a, a lot of those uh, blighted areas where young people could learn the skill set through workforce development. Uh, I mean, so I would like to know that plan. Uh, I like okay. the guys to the right of me talk about all the technical stuff. I like to talk about the human services side of it. I understand. We are going to set up, it will be an RFP. So, um, you know, it will depend on how many people apply for RFP and give us a proposal as well. All right. But as long as, I mean, and I understand that you only get what you get, but if you don't have goals, you know, no one's going to live up to the expectations. So, I mean, to me, before we got a final contract that I would vote for the allocation of funds, yes, uh, those issues would have to be addressed and, and included. And so, yes, sir. I'll uh, contact them when I go in the back room and I'll have a number. Yeah, I just like to know the goals of, yes, sir. of what we're doing for small minority businesses and, and what is our inclusion program and, and what type of workforce programs have they done in the past? I mean, what's their history? And okay. so that would be critical for, for my vote. Yes, sir. I'm sure they have that number. They've worked with 80 other electric cooperatives doing this exact same thing. So I'm sure they have a plan. Okay. I look forward to hearing it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, I think that ends our presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Our now, first speaker will be Stan McDaniels. Madam Clerk, even though we didn't have an extra seven minutes of questions, he was afforded it if he so needed. Is that good? Okay. No, we didn't, we didn't end him. He ended on his own. Yeah. Stan McDaniels, uh, currently at 4511 Charmont Way, Pensacola, Florida. Um, just um, wanted to come up here and address you guys on this uh, project. Uh, I know I have a lot of experience in this particular industry, um, and I've, I've been a supervisor over many projects for the rings that go around to ensure Navy Federal Credit Union never loses uh, its service there for um, the call center there. So I'm very familiar with this subject and topic. Um, my question is, is why do, does this industry need a subsidy 
from the government to provide our, cust our county service. If they've already got a contract here to provide service to anyone in this county, why can't we hold their feet to the fire so that they can provide all of our county with service? Uh, these are big budgets, big companies that have been in, in service for a long time, and there's no reason why they can't be on the hook to provide this stuff for our customers. So why can't these private companies make the investment instead of the taxpayers? Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Our next speaker will be Kevin Wade. Thank you. Kevin Wade, 4 and 3 Southeast Bowlets. Um, even Navy Federal didn't come here without subsidies that they're even getting now, sir. And Starlink, <laughs> uh, Skynet, all the rest of these, like 1984. Oh, what was the year that the date, August 29th, 1997, was burned into every young boy's head who got to go to the movies and see the Terminator because that was the date that Starlink went AI. Skynet, Skynet yes, sir. And you can't, you can't go ahead and put your faith into Musk. You can't put your faith into uh, satellite communications yet. Oh, Netflix, it takes five megabits of low jitter rate streaming availability. Five megabits. A um, hundred megabits is the lowest that these gentlemen have all talked about. Uh, and I keep hearing synchronous. I want 100 megabits synchronous, and I'm, we're, this, this is, Cox is giving gigabit-ish, and it ain't synchronous. Um, uh, everything I hear is just awesome, like, and the dream of bringing this broadband to the rural areas, please, thank you. Keep that dream, keep it going. Um, and the, the technology that everyone's talking about, all of it has merit, yes. Um, the, the idea of going to uh, Starlink, which is the, the Ukrainians have shown that, okay, it can be slightly effective on the battlefield as long as Musk wants to have it turned on for you. And it has been turned off quite a few times. So um, seriously crippling, um, absolutely crippling. Uh, underground, that's great, up in the air, that's fine. Uh, please bring this because, you know, even, even, even the five, 5G solutions, okay, I, I've got several properties that underground from building to building, but we live by Wi-Fi. And the Wi-Fi that we have, I can walk 300 yards in the park and I'm just fine. I can set it up easily so that I, I can, if I know I'm going to be a mile away, I've got that capability. And bringing this to the rural areas is just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next speaker, Melissa Pino. Thank you, Chairman Ben Lispino, 413 Southeast Bobless. Oh my God, can you guys please send away this federal money to Santa Rosa or Alabama or Georgia or someplace else to satisfy our red meat base? Spare us the federal money and the infrastructure, please. <laughs> Years ago, when Commissioner Barry first started talking about this, what, three years ago? I sent y'all an email, Chattanooga, ding, 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 three years ago. Dave Merzen knows better than anybody in the room what this means for economic development. And in the intervening years, from the first articles I was sending, y'all, on the economic development benefits of the broadband, there have been more studies, billions of dollars of economic impact on this type of infrastructure up in Chattanooga. And, and Commissioner Bergash, I appreciate your due diligence on the Starlink, because even now in my phone, so I, I'm getting texts this morning Morning. I supported the broadband, but somebody just told me there's a futuristic, cheaper way to do it called Starlink. <sighs> 
uh, Skylink, what, you know, whatever he wants to call it today. I mean, Elon Musk could decide that he's going to build a missile to shoot the moon out of the sky, wake up one morning, and decide to take down his own satellites. Uh, if you want to know why not to rely on that, ask Tesla stockholders, uh, right? And, uh, and Commissioner Kohler, with all due respect, I'm begging you to think hard before you make a vote that would box your own constituents out in the future <laughs> because we want this. And I'm so appreciative of Commissioner Bender. Could you get it in today to make an announce on people going on to try to correct the fact that the politicians on the, uh, on the FCC are gaming for AT&T and Musk and all the big boys again with the crap that they're pulling on their maps. Everyone needs to go on and correct their neighborhoods. I've told you guys before, we killed $760 of Cox a month because they cannot and will not deliver. We would pay anything to get this fiber to our house. Guess what? They won't give it. So I really hope that in the second phase, rather than waste money on what pockets and what neighborhoods can get this blessed service, just do the whole county. Just do the whole county, please. And thank you. Commissioner Barry, for sticking through a lot of ridiculousness. This is a legacy project you're always going to be able to be proud of. Mr. Chairman, that's all the speakers. That's all the speakers, my friend. All right, thank you. Uh, and board, I appreciate y'all uh, engaging and, and you know being so active in the discussion today and and taking the time to you know kind of go through the process that began in November and you know hopefully we're coming to some culmination today but when you know when you look at the two proposals I mean there's no question uh, that the IBT group has has the ability and the, the ability and the partners to uh, uh, to successfully do the project I don't think that's I don't think that's a question what you what you end up uh, you know when you're comparing the proposals and, and trying to you know ascertain value to uh, uh, you know, to what's going to be the best use of the, you know, of the uh, county dollars, uh, you know, the partnership dollars that we have to kind of put into the project. Um, even in the first proposal, uh, one of the gentlemen, when Commissioner Bergash was interacted with him, was, you know, kind of referring to, uh, to a dynamic that I think outlines the advantage, the strategic advantage that EREC has. Um, he actually mentioned that long term this would be similar to the electrical distribution that was built out 80 years ago and that's i think that kind of highlights the 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 reason why erec has the ability to deploy the project in the way that they do because they have that electrical infrastructure in place um you know we've got uh you know one of the other gentlemen even from the first presenter uh first group talked about the prospect because they're they and anyone else in this scenario is having to start from scratch infrastructure wise so it was mentioned that a full fiber to the home build out would be multiple times the 10 million that we have set aside to actually get fiber to the home you know whether that I don't know what he was uh, you know exactly what he was saying but you know exponentially more two three times more to get fiber to the homes and a five to ten year build out <clears throat> and that's not surprising if you're talking about getting it to every one of these homes that are, and many of them are, uh, you know, there's distances between them. They're, uh, you know, often, um, you know, kind of out there on an island, uh, on a rural island. So, you know, that possibility of costing, you know, two or three times the amount that we've set aside, that you know, twenty, thirty million dollars, and being a five to ten year timeline was what uh, was what one of the gentlemen in the first group presented to get fiber to all the homes. And again, that's because. There's just not there's not infrastructure in place for them right now. They don't have the strategic advantage that EREC has, uh, you know. And EREC went through a process to partner with someone, so that's you know that's that's their process. So now they've got a, they've got a partner, and the prospect of them, you know, in the first in the first presentation, we've got 109 miles of underground fiber, you know, being laid. Um, you know, as that as that back, as that backbone, and the rest of it going wireless. Um, you know, in the, in Erex proposal, we've got you know almost 600 miles of fiber being run, with 175 miles of it being underground, um, for you know considerably less uh, considerably less uh, county contribution. Additionally, you know, instead of 2,000 homes, we're going to be serving you know over 4,000 homes and businesses up there. 
Um, it's just, it's, a, it's certainly a process that, that we had to go through and it's the, it's the right way to do things. I want to thank Allison and Wes for, um, you know, for helping me try to, helping me try to navigate, you know, navigate how to get this service, uh, how to get this project deployed for my constituents to get this service availability. But with a, with a motivated effort from a cooperative, a nonprofit cooperative, with a motivated effort from them, which, you know, we clearly have a motivated effort from them, I'm not surprised necessarily that another for-profit company that doesn't have those strategic advantages in place can't match, you know, can't match uh, apples for apples for the uh, for the benefit for our uh, for our dollars and the full deployment of the of the program. Um, like I said, there, you know, I, and I, I appreciate the first group's presentation, and I don't have any I don't have any question whether they have the ability. To, I'm you know familiar with a couple of those companies. I, I know that they have the ability to. Uh, to do the work and uh, and deploy the project, but financially, timeline and service being delivered, I, I don't think it's uh, I think it's very clear that um, uh, that EREC is the proposal. And what I'm hoping, and I'm you know happy to talk as long as you guys would like to, but what I'm hoping at the end of today is that the board is going to support um, authorizing you know uh, Allison and West to try to get an uh, MOU executed with EREC for. Uh, you know, for deploying this project and getting it going as quick as possible. Commissioner Barry, I, yes, sir. Um, I, I don't think we need to talk. I, I agree with you 100%. I think the uh, just sitting here and watching the presentation, listening to the answers, um, I've already completed my sheet. So, uh, I, you know, unless you guys have a lot of other questions, um, I would ask Mr. Chairman that we complete our score sheets and, and move forward. I'm good with that. I've completed mine as well. Well, if you're making a motion. I mean, do we need to complete this? Uh, I, have, I, I have a few more comments before we vote. We definitely please. need to complete the score sheets, and then we can do a motion on the back side of the completion of the score sheets. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Kohler. I want to highlight a few things um, on this process because it, it's concerning. And then I agree with what you said, Chairman Barry, on EREC. But I want to remind everyone this was called the American Rescue Plan. It was a rescue plan that was to help people immediately to get access because their kids were out of school, um, health care facilities. It passed by $1.9 trillion. Not one Republican voted for it in the House. One Democrat didn't vote for it in the House. Not one Republican voted for it in the Senate. I'm very familiar with Christmas in September in the federal government. We love to spend money after it's other people's money. The cost of this is excessive, extremely excessive. And I can share with you, we could easily meet the underserved and the people that need this the same way we do the CRAs. I've been doing math up here the whole time. And we could save millions of dollars and meet the requirement of 25 and 3 that's out there. And use those additional ARPA funds for septic to sewer, for all these other things that we could use them for. The cost is just excessive for me. No one in this room would have done this project if you didn't have federal funds. That's the truth. Because it's not economically smart to do it. I think that we should look at that seriously, the cost. And if we really want to help the people with broadband, we can buy it. We can give it to them for millions of dollars cheaper. All right, thank you. We'll give you, we'll give everybody a few minutes to finish your paper. If there's no more discussion. I mean, I've already completed mine. I know everyone else isn't, this really isn't on the topic, but, but Mike, to your point, I, I do agree with you in some respects about the federal spending and um, it's a terrible system and uh, we're, we're printing money up there like crazy. We wonder why eggs are $8 a dozen. Um, we wonder why inflation is going through the roof. It's because at the federal level, there is no restraint to the spending, no, no balanced budget act, no term limits, which are desperately needed. And so look, hate, hate, hate the game. Don't hate the player. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to play within the rules and the framework that we have. We got this federal money, um, whether or not we agree with whether it should have been appropriated, uh, that's a different discussion, but the money's here 
And I think the federal government does have a role to play in commerce. They built the highway system, which was an amazing investment that we all benefit from. And I, I really don't see this uh, as much of a different thing. This is the new highway of the future. So um, I agree with you on the spending. I'd love a balanced uh, budget act. I'd love to see a federal term limits bill, but there's those things we'll never see. And if we get wrapped around the axle about federal stuff over which we have zero control, uh, we won't get a lot of things done locally. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Gosh. So, Allison, we need, can we entertain a motion now? Do we need to hey, You need your purchasing director to indicate the scoring? Is he going to give it? He's. Jeff, are you going to give us an average? Or are you going to give us each commission? How are you going to break it out for us? No, you just need to give us a total score of, of, of no, everybody. I think, I think yes, sir. What I'm planning on doing is putting all the information in and then coming up with a total raw score, and then the commissioners can decide from there. All right. Thank you. How long will it take you? Do we need a recess or can you do that? Well, I'm doing head math, so, you know, a couple minutes. A little right. smoke. Don't worry about it over here. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Chairman, I have the final number, the total number for you. Uh, <clears throat> for IBT PCS, we had a total score. Again, there were 100 total points per voter uh, in the five commissioners, so that would be a maximum score of 500 points. Uh, IBT PCS has scored 462 points uh, okay. for the whole group. And <clears throat> Connexon, by comparison, scored 484 points from the commissioners. And I'll have uh, that break oh, available that again? to everyone today. Uh, 462 uh -huh. for the first presenting group uh -huh. and 484 for the second group. Can I ask a question? Okay, Chair, I entertain a motion at this time. Can I ask a question though? Je Jeffrey, usually you rank them in, and how many, how many of us ranked, a, ranked one, one, how many of them ranked them two? Uh, What's the question again? Votes? I'm Is that sorry? A, how many first place votes did how each one get? How many first place get? votes did each, each one have? Uh, let's see. <clears throat> I mean, because if it's total score, then someone could give them another mm -hmm. one of them a zero on something and totally wow. swing yeah. it. So well, how many first place scores did, did each uh, one have? Actually, that's a close Sorry, score. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just double checking my numbers here. Uh, it looks like it is, uh, there was one commissioner that had a tie, uh, but the remainder um, had a clear delineation, even if it was just a single point, uh, but it was unanimous for Connexon. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's actually a pretty close score, Robert. It's a 20 point differential. I mean, sure. five point points, you're only looking at 20 points. No, I, I know that, but I'm just saying if, if it was based on total points, then someone could, I mean, you could, one commissioner could swing it as opposed to showing that four of them had it had yeah one as theoretically a, a yeah but i mean yes. with a 20 point difference I, I would assume that that didn't happen robert just to put clear i didn't want to be that guy so i voted the same <laughs> no so, well with that will the chair will entertain right. a motion thank you mr chairman and, and I, I think you know the the high score for even the first you know even the first presenter is indicative of the fact that they have the capacity to do the project it's just um, in this scenario, I, I think it would have been, I think it would have been extremely difficult for any any for-profit company to come in that doesn't have infrastructure to compete, you know, effectively. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would move that the board uh, that the board authorize Wes and Allison to uh, to negotiate an MOU with uh, the Connects and Compete slash uh, Escambia River Electric Co-op uh, joint venture. I'll second the motion. It's a motion second. And Commissioner Berry, I mean, not as an am amendment, but at, at least as, as a point of clarification, uh, as we go into that contract, there was some information that I asked of both presenters, and uh, they both said they would get that information back, and I expressed uh, that I couldn't support it unless we got that back by contract. I'll go along to vote for the vote, but I would hope that that information would be brought back. Put some of the, well, put, maybe, maybe have some of those, have some of those, Indicators, some of those thresholds, some of those goals and objectives uh, included in the MOU, Commissioner. That's what, that's what I was kind of presuming. You're before you vote to approve the MOU, you want to see some of that language in there about their, yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and I'm certainly comfortable with that, and, and I'm sure. Al, I mean, Allison and Wes are listening, so there you go. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the winner raised his hand, so that's all I would expect. Right. I want to thank um, the group for coming down. Thank all the presenters. Uh, we appreciate your time. We know it takes time, effort, and resources to ever come into a presentation. So, so with that, we'll take the vote. Uh, all in favor? That's four in favor. All opposed? We have one for the record. Commissioner Kohler opposes. But that being said, uh, the motion wins four to one. We stand adjourned.